Hey, it's Kay, and this is Skittles, legal consultant. Of the many accusations levied towards Jeremy Corbyn and the left wing of the Labour Party over the past few years, perhaps none have been as significant and long-running as accusations of anti-Semitism, of fostering an environment that breeds anti-Semitism, and of refusing to punish people within the party who engage in anti-Semitism. If you've followed British politics at all during this period, you've probably seen countless headlines, interview questions, and even even a BBC panorama, all leading to the same conclusion. Labour is systemically anti-Semitic and Corbyn's side of the party is to blame. In April of this year, a report was leaked, despite the specific requests of party lawyers to keep it quiet. This report was carried out to investigate Labour's handling, or lack thereof, of anti-Semitism complaints within the party, to be submitted as part of an investigation by the Equality and Human Rights Commission, and what it turned up is deeply disturbing, as well as very inconvenient for Starmer and the rest of the Labour right. There's two main points about this report that we're going to explore today. The nature of the anti-Semitism situation within the Labour Party and the factionalism at play during the past few years. First, the anti-Semitism. So the media narrative over the past few years went like this. Labour is systemically anti-Semitic and it is because Jeremy Corbyn is an anti-Semite who is not taking anti-Semitism seriously and is intentionally going easy on people who complaints have been made against. Before even diving into this report, however, we should consider the suggestion that Labour is particularly anti-Semitic. This report does not claim, and I would never suggest, that no anti-Semitism exists within the Labour Party, as it exists, unfortunately, throughout British society. But for years, stories of this great anti-Jewish conspiracy within the party dominated political discourse, but has been accompanied by precious little evidence. In fact, YouGov polling, featured in a Campaign Against Anti-Semitism report, shows that when presented with eight anti-Semitic statements, more conservative party members agreed with one or more of these statements than Labour members. And indeed, the general public was more likely to agree with one or more anti-Semitic statement than Labour, and less than the Conservatives. This indicates that Labour membership is less anti-Semitic than the general population, and that Conservative membership is more anti-Semitic than the general population. And that's not even getting into other forms of racism, which surely would not go well for the Tories, since 56% of their membership in a 2019 poll said they believe Islam is a threat to British life, and 68% believe the lie that their are areas in Britain that operate under Sharia law. So, in the search for evidence of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party to a greater extent than other political parties or the country as a whole, we only really turn up evidence of the very opposite. Already, this is raising questions about why Corbyn had to spend years constantly answering for the supposed rampant anti-Semitism of his party, while Boris Johnson scarcely has to do the same for the greater levels of anti-Semitism and the wide variety of other bigotries his party holds, and that he himself has contributed to on numerous occasions. However, when polled about which party has done too little to deal with anti-Semitism in its own ranks, British Jews overwhelmingly said the Labour Party. It would be easy to say this perception is due to the aforementioned endless questioning of Labour leadership about why they're big, awful anti-Semites and they love anti-Semitism so much. And I mean, it, it definitely is largely due to that, let's not kid ourselves. Though I'm sure that Jewish voters being more likely to vote conservative probably helped it go down easier. But for the sake of argument, there may be a legitimate worry that even if Labour has less anti-Semitism than other parties, that they are handling it so ineffectively that it becomes a greater threat. This worry is reinforced by the fact that the Equality and Human Rights Commission is investigating the Labour Party. Not the Conservative Party, not UKIP or the Brexit Party, only Labour. 
and only during the tenure of a left-wing leader, despite, again, far more evidence of systemic racism in those other parties. Curious. So, to speak to how Labour handled anti-Semitism complaints, let's look to the report. The report notes that there is abundant evidence of a hyper-factional atmosphere prevailing in Party HQ in this period, which appears to have affected the expeditious and resolute handling of disciplinary complaints, and that many staff, including GLU staff and senior staff with responsibility for managing and overseeing GLU, were bitterly opposed to the leadership of Jeremy Corbyn, and seem to have been demotivated, or largely interested in work that could advance a factional agenda. At its extreme, some employees seem to have taken the view that the worse things got for Labour, the happier they would be, since this might expedite Jeremy Corbyn's departure from office. The report shows Sam Matthews, who was in charge of handling the complaints procedure, was actively obstructive to the process. He worked under Ian McNichol, the General Secretary of the Labour Party until 2018, seen in multiple leaked chat logs actively dismaying at the idea of Corbyn becoming leader and at Corbyn gaining seats in the 2017 general election. Let's talk about Sam Matthews for a minute. Prior to this report being released, Matthews spent a lot of time in the media spotlight insisting that anti-Semitism is not only endemic in the Labour Party, again, despite all evidence to the contrary, but also insisting that it is not only Corbyn's fault, but that he and his cabinet are actively lying about it and obstructing him. Matthews was a whistleblower that took part in a hotly contested BBC Panorama episode about anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, and said it included important disclosures about how deep the rot inside the Labour Party goes. Speaking to The Independent last year, Matthews said he had witnessed firsthand the complete failure of the party processes to adequately deal with anti-Jewish racism. He continued, By the end of my time there, I witnessed daily interference in the process, meaning that my team and I, who were responsible for discipline in the party, were simply unable to do our jobs. Matthews was removed from the position shortly after Jenny Formby took Ian McNichol's job in 2018. Now, 2018 is an important year in this investigation, because it's the year that many of the old guards sympathetic to the Blair era were removed from key positions such as General Secretary. And it's also the year the report notes that the handling of anti-Semitism complaints became far more robust and effective. To understand why that is, we need to look to what the report tells us about the performance of Matthews and McNichol. The report notes, This investigation has revealed to the party that in this period before Jenny Formby became General Secretary in spring 2018, GLU failed to act on the vast majority of complaints received, including the vast majority of complaints regarding anti-Semitic conduct. But let's take a closer look at exactly what they were up to, because simply put, Matthews wasn't doing his job. And when he did, it was often in a malicious and actively obstructive manner. The inbox used for receipt of complaints would go months without any staff member tending to it, and in dozens of cases, staff even emailed head of dispute Sam Matthews, proposing that an investigation be launched, but he failed to act or respond. Matthews appeared to have been the main blockage to action on anti-Semitic cases, and the few cases that were acted upon were mostly the result of other senior labor staff directly chasing him. From the 1st of November 2016 to the 19th of February 2018, there were just two cases reported in this period where head of dispute Sam Matthews acted in accordance with the designed processes and authorized action, which was then taken without having a personal relationship with the complainant or being chased by senior labor staff. This amounted to fewer than 1% of the anti-Semitism cases submitted in this period that should have been investigated and acted upon. 
The report is full of instances of Matthews and McNichol being lenient toward right-wing Labour members with complaints against them and being extra punitive against left-wing Labour members in too many shockingly unprofessional instances to go into in this video. The report also notes that after Matthews and McNichol were replaced by individuals less openly hostile to Corbyn, systems were finally put in place and properly followed to help handle complaints. The headline that isn't being reported on is rather than failing to properly handle anti-Semitism complaints, Corbyn and his side of the party are the main reason the party ever began to handle them properly at all. The report notes that the complaint system prior to 2015, the year Corbyn became leader, was woefully inadequate. Lord knows what was going on under Blair. It says GLU's disciplinary processes in 2015 to 2016 were characterized by an almost complete lack of systems, processes, guidances, and training for staff members. There was no system for logging all complaints. And, before 2015, GLU appears to have only done small amounts of work relating to disciplinary cases. Staff appear to have been accustomed to being subject to little or no scrutiny or oversight from within Labour HQ or externally. And the processes that did exist were equipped to, at best, deal with a small number of cases very slowly and in an ad hoc manner. This approach allowed for decisions to be influenced by personal responsibilities and political allegiances. For example, after complaints about Rod Little over transphobic and Islamophobic comments, GLU proposed suspending him and wrote to the leader of the opposition to let them know, as Rod Little is a journalist. Leader of the opposition agreed with the proposed suspension. However, GLU's director then informed the executive director of governance, membership, and party services that apparently Rod Little is chummy with Ian Austin and, by extension, Tom Watson and suggested they sit on it for now, rather than suspend immediately. The executive director replied, OK, I will speak to Ian, presumably a reference to consulting Ian Austin on a disciplinary case against his friend. So what we've seen is that Matthews actively ignored, obstructed, and mishandled anti-Semitism complaints despite being repeatedly chased by others within the party, including Corbyn himself, and then went to the media to complain that anti-Semitism complaints weren't being taken care of within the party. This right-wing saboteur created a problem and then used it to smear the labor left as anti-Semitism. When indeed, anti-Semitism complaints only began to be handled appropriately under Corbyn's leadership. Years of Blairite control had resulted in a complaint system that allowed for people to let their friends off the hook when convenient. But Matthews and McNichol were not the only ones purposely obstructing the handling of anti-Semitism complaints to hurt Corbyn's leadership. Other bad actors intentionally flooded the party with disingenuous complaints. In fact, the report notes that half of all anti-Semitism complaints the party received during the period covered in the investigation came from one person. Literally, a social media troll who spammed the party with spurious complaints described as poorly evidenced and submitted in a format that hinders investigation, this individual repeatedly emails about the same cases, cluttering the complaints inbox and taking staff time, as staff always have to check whether a case already exists or not, and whether or not all the evidence the complainant is providing has already been logged. A large proportion of the people this individual complains about are either not party members or are already in the disciplinary process, something the complainant has been told repeatedly. The complainant is often rude and abusive in their replies to staff responding to his complaints. The party is also aware that the complainant uses similar language towards people, including Labour members, on social media. And this person isn't alone. One spokesperson from Labour Against Antisemitism, a right-wing Zionist group who has dedicated recent years to opposing the Labour left, submitted the following anti-Semitism complaints. Retweeting the word Blairite. 
retweeting a cartoon of Theresa May, Philip Hammond, and Boris Johnson in which the latter two are children, based on a viral incident where the children of an expert being interviewed by the BBC wandered into shot during the interview. They maintained this was very crass. Retweeting Michael Moore saying arrest Trump regarding Russiagate, calling for the arrest and the impeachment of Trump, writing what planet is this president on in reference to Trump, and retweeting an article on Bernie Sanders calling on Donald Trump to fire Steve Bannon. Hang on, I think I must have read that wrong. Let me, let me try that again. Submitted as a complaint about anti-Semitism is somebody retweeting an article on Bernie Sanders calling on Donald Trump to fire known white supremacist and anti-Semite Steve Bannon. Yeah, okay, sure, why not? So we see that not only was the handling of genuine anti-Semitism complaints intentionally hindered by people on the right wing of the party purposely ignoring them, but the number of complaints was also artificially inflated by bad faith actors hostile to the left purposely flooding the complaints department with garbage. But MPs were involved in this too, don't you worry. WhatsApp discussions among senior Labour HQ staff show that Leader of the Opposition was unhappy with the NCC panel's decision to suspend Ken Livingston for another year rather than expel him. Emily Oldno wrote that Kerry has been telling Shadow Cabinet members that I've orchestrated the Ken situation, so Tom got his people on the panel to make a soft decision, all in order to embarrass Jeremy Corbyn and create a crisis. That's Emily Oldno, senior member of Labour's management team actively sabotaging the expulsion of an individual subject to a high-profile anti-Semitism investigation explicitly to make Jeremy Corbyn look bad with the assistance of MP Tom Watson. Oldno was being considered to take Formby's place as general secretary under the leadership of Keir Starmer when this report leaked. Thing is, Starmer likely knew all of this before this report was even written, because there was a concerted effort to force a leadership election in 2016 to oust Corbyn, in which many of these same right-wing bad actors participated, and Keir Starmer was one of them. Keir Starmer is part of the Blairite right of the Labour Party who, all throughout this report, can be found not only intentionally ignoring complaints of anti-Semitism to feed the narrative that the left somehow makes anti-Semitism happen, but actively trying to lose general elections. We'll get to that in a moment. First, what have we learned about anti-Semitism in the Labour Party? Is Labour particularly anti-Semitic? Evidence tends to point to the exact opposite conclusion, that Labour is one of our least anti-Semitic political institutions and indeed is less anti-Semitic than the general public. The Lib Dems were the only party that displayed less anti-Semitism, so all ten of them, well, they've got that going for them. Is there anti-Semitism in the Labour Party? Yes, of course. You'd be out of your mind to deny that because there is anti-Semitism throughout British society. This is a pretty racist country, unfortunately. But the constant media attention, the Equality and Human Rights Commission investigation into anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, something only carried out once before with the neo-Nazi BNP, that is not how you react to a party with a below-average presence of anti-Semitism. That is how you react to a party, well, like the Conservative Party. So the narrative around Labour and its supposedly exceptional anti-Semitism problem is categorically false. But they know that. The Tories know that. The media knows that. The Blairites know that. But when you look at everything we know about this mess, when you look at the way far more anti-Semitic institutions have been ignored to focus in on the left wing of British electoral politics, when you look at how, throughout this report, active Holocaust deniers are given a slap on the wrist by the Blairite-led complaints team, when you look at how Keir Starmer is being heralded as an end to this dark era of anti-Semitism and hate, despite collaborating with the people who actively ignored anti-Semitism complaints, despite putting Rachel Reeves on his cabinet, 
who openly praised Nancy Astor, a literal Nazi-sympathizing anti-Semite, just months ago. And none of the papers seem to think there's anything fishy about that. While the left is under scrutiny to the degree that even criticizing the state of Israel is supposedly adequate evidence to brand someone a massive anti-Semite. Well, it's hard not to come to the conclusion that this was never about anti-Semitism. This was about attacking the left. And while we're likely to see these issues of anti-Semitism fade from public discourse as the right wing of the Labour Party reasserts control and Starmer eagerly declares himself a Zionist, while silencing Palestinian voices, something else has been achieved over these past few years that may be even more damaging. Anti-Semitism has been cleaved off from all other forms of racism as a unique entity in mainstream political discourse that can now be used as a weapon. And that weapon is almost exclusively wielded by the right, by people who are part of political institutions that buddy up to real anti-Semites like Viktor Orban. Letting people who rub shoulders with Holocaust deniers and fascists control the narrative about anti-Semitism with a media apparatus that will parrot that narrative and use it to attack actual anti-racists, this complete inversion of reality in our political discourse will only benefit the powerful and will only put Jewish people at greater risk. Nobody benefits from this shit except actual anti-Semites. Back to Kier and his Blairite buddies. The active stoking of this fabricated anti-Semitism crisis in the party was part of an orchestrated effort to hurt Corbyn's electoral performance and force him to step down so that the right wing of the party could regain control. This report details their efforts to sabotage their own party in the 2017 election. Notably, a lot of the damage they caused only fully came home to roost by 2019. This massive 850-page report details so many acts of hostility and active sabotage against the left wing of the party that I simply cannot go through them all here. So I'm going to list a few of the most egregious ones and attempt to paint a picture of how openly destructive the labor right has been over the past few years. This report details frequent bullying of left-wing activists, staff, and MPs, with chat logs showing numerous racist, sexist, and ableist tirades, as well as labor staff dismaying at their own party, polling well and saying it makes them feel ill, and insulting people for opposing British imperialism, joking about assaulting left-wing labor supporters, as well as talking about literally murdering Jeremy Corbyn by burning and hanging him, as well as shooting the MPs who nominated him for leader. Followed by even more dismay when Labour forced a hung parliament in 2017, with Ian McNichol offering a safe space in his office for people to come and vent. McNichol's response to Labour getting the highest share of the popular vote in 20 years and taking the majority away from the Tories was simply, it is going to be a long night. In August 2015, senior staff explored delaying or cancelling the ongoing leadership election when it looked like Jeremy Corbyn was going to win. When Corbyn was elected, staff discussed plans for a coup. One staffer said, we need a poll that says we're like 20 points behind. Another suggested a silver lining for Remain losing the 2016 European referendum would be that Corbyn could be held responsible. And another hoped that poor performance in the May 2016 local elections would be the catalyst for a coup. This is the coup, of course, that the now leader Keir Starmer participated in. Staff described working to rule when Corbyn was elected and coming into the office and doing nothing for a few months. During the 2017 election, staff joked about hardly working and created a chat so they could pretend to work while actually speaking to each other. Senior staff coordinated refusing to share basic information to leader of the opposition during the election, such as candidates' contact details. 
Labour HQ operated a secret key seats team based in Labour's London region office in Ergen House, from where a parallel general election campaign was run to support MPs associated with the right wing of the party. Staff applied the same factional approach to disciplinary processes, of course. One staff member referred to Emily Oldno expecting staff to fabricate a case against people she doesn't like slash her friends don't like because of their political views. During the 2015 leadership election, GLU and other Labour staff described their work as hunting out thousands of trots and a trot hunt, which included excluding people for having liked the Greens on Facebook. One prominent GLU staffer, head of disputes Catherine Buckingham, admitted that real work is piling up, while she and other staff were engaged in inappropriate factional work. Perhaps most egregious and potentially criminal of all, these right-wing saboteurs within the Labour Party actively diverted funds out of marginal seats and gave it to their co-conspirators like Tom Watson. This is especially noteworthy because Labour lost the 2017 election by such a slim margin that just over 2,000 votes in a handful of marginal seats would have been the difference between victory. Marginal seats that were having their campaign funds robbed by Blairites trying to secure power for their friends while undermining the party in the election. I don't think that it is at all unreasonable to say that the active hostility and obstruction intentionally not working and siphoning money out of marginal seats likely made the difference between Labour winning and losing the 2017 election. We are condemned now to years of a continuing homelessness crisis, disabled people dying in droves due to benefit sanctions to a degree that the UN has condemned the British government for it, because, as has always been the case, Blairites will always side with the other Tories who are honest enough to stay in the Tory party over the left and the the interests of the working class. And now their large wet boy Keir Starmer is in charge. He's filling his cabinet with some of the worst people on the Labour right who have spent the last five years attacking Corbyn and the left at every turn. He tried to keep this report from the public and has now enlisted a panel of Labour peers, those are literal lords and ladies for those who don't know, to carry out a witch hunt for the whistleblower while attempting to do damage control because his side of the party is so thoroughly implicated by this report, and he has the audacity to call for unity. Let me be 100% clear. Do not vote for Keir Starmer. While the absolute decline of centrist politics since the end of the Blair era indicates very little chance of a Starmer victory in the next general election, his attacks on the left and appeasement of capital will give him a much easier ride in the media, so there might be a slim chance. And would he be better than Boris Johnson? Probably, yes. Tony Blair was better than the Tories in some ways too. But what you need to understand and this can be difficult to fully appreciate if you didn't live through this period in British history, is that Blair did more damage to the working class and the wider political project of socialism than any Tory could have ever hoped, save for maybe Thatcher. Thatcher, by the way, was a friend of Tony Blair's and hailed New Labour as one of her greatest achievements, and she was right. When the conservatives, widely understood to be the enemies of the working class, drag us into horrific imperialist wars, privatize our public services, and smash our unions, that gives us something to rally against. But when it comes from what we've been led to believe is the left, when it comes from the party we've supported, we've given our time and energy to, we've stuck our necks out for, it's humiliating. It's demoralizing. Tony Blair's tenure politically devastated the working class of this country to such a degree that we are still recovering from it. And in labor, we are still fighting factional battles against his ilk, as they sabotage us at every turn, as this report details. 
I'm one of the vulnerable, poor, disabled people that the Tories push into the meat grinder every single day. And I will say unequivocally that neither Cameron, nor May, nor Johnson could ever destroy our communities like Tony Blair. I've spent my entire adult life in the northwest of England, but to drive this point home, I'd like to end this video by reading a short segment written by someone who grew up here, before Blair. This is from the intro to local poet-slash-comedian Thick Richard's book Vaudevillain, in which he describes hearing urban legends of large cats and other wild beasts loose in the town, and growing up in a relatively impoverished place called Northern Moor in South Manchester. He remembers it as a place so wild that he thought those urban myths could really be true there. He talks about the community and the political mindedness of the place he grew up, and then he talks about moving back to that place. Post Blair. One good memory of that place was the 96 election. It was a hot day and we'd spent the afternoon drinking in the back garden, talking about how Labour would definitely win. Things can only get better, eh Tony? In the evening, we went off to vote. A shiny-faced Tory boy stood at the door of the polling station with a huge, ridiculous blue rosette pinned to his lapel like an elephant's arsehole. And I trust you'll be voting conservative today? He simpered smugly. My dad leant towards him, their noses almost touching. Fuck off, he bellowed. Well, things didn't get better, did they? They got worse. The angry young men got tired of fighting and became embarrassed old men. Shamed by getting sold out by new labor, the politicians hid. Never again would they be made to venture into the estates and have to debate face to face with their people. The working class capitalists borrowed so much invisible money to keep up their pretenses that many became sub-working class capitalists, indebted so far into the negatives it would become their grandchildren's inheritance. Issues became so complicated it felt like what was being discussed was none of our business, and many people started to shy away from political debate through fear of coming across as stupid. Then the confusing issues just became boring issues. The internet had evidence to back up every side of every argument, so everyone fell into the false security trap that they were all in the right. Communities stopped communicating, generation gaps grew, leaving room for bad ideas to breed, and now racism is an actual political opinion. We've never been so divided, and it all happened right under our noses. I moved back to Northern Moor in my early 30s. It's a sour, haunted place that would have Fergie waking up screaming. Its political edge grew blunt long ago. The thugs of the neighborhood used to seem like Robin Hoods. Their disobedient was righteous and justified. Their tempers were taut but focused on the right targets. Built for a fight if needs be, but perfectly capable of letting their words do the dirty work. They'd never be able to save up for a holiday, but the money could always be found to march on London, demand answers, and shake Tony Benn's hand. These days, they keep themselves to themselves and prey on one another. Quiet. Invisible. Forgotten. Obedient. And so now we all just hope for the rumors to start spreading again of the wild beasts of the past. The animals of passionate anger who would have never let this happen. Returning to prowl the streets again, keeping the territory safe from harm. Watching the pack and planning attacks to keep the real wolves at bay. And other urban myths.